Now let's take a look at the mixer page. As you can see, this page resembles the layout of a mixing board. You can set initial levels for each track or record changes in real time. You can play the song and change the levels and pan position for various tracks. In addition, you can mute individual tracks using the eight mode buttons. You can access all 16 tracks by switching from 1 through 8 or 9 through 16. The muting is temporary and is in effect only while on the mixer page. Once you have the settings you desire, you can press Keep to update the initial volume and pan settings found at the beginning of the track. If you want to record changes in real time, then you would record while on the mixer page and make your changes. Next, we'll take a look at the Arrange feature. I'm going to call up a song in which I've already created an arrangement. You can start with a new song again. Now press Edit, and then Arrange. On this page, you can take various songs and string them together to form an arrangement. This is extremely useful for saving memory. The 2600 has a limitation of 64K for any object except a sample. If you have a long and complex song, you can break it up into sections and save each section as a separate song. Then you can use the Arrange Editor to put the sections together. If you have a section that repeats, you don't need to save it twice. You can have the Arrange Editor play it twice. Let's look at the parameters on this page. Each part of the arrangement is called a step. For each step, you assign a song. I have song number 300 for the first step. As I scroll through the steps, you can see the song assigned to each step. To add new steps, you can press the Add button. You can delete a step with the Delete button. For each step, you can choose to mute individual tracks. In this way, you could assign the same song to two steps, but mute different tracks in each step. Then when you play the arrangement, you will hear two different sections, even though they were using the same song. You can also transpose a step and have it repeat any number of times. One great feature is that you can trigger steps from various keys and then play along with them, so you can spread your different sequences across the keyboard and trigger them in any order you want to create arrangements in real time. As you can see, I've assigned the first song from C1 to G1, the second song from C2 to G2, etc. Since the song is assigned to a group of keys, as I play up and down the keyboard, the entire sequence will be transposed. However, I don't want the drums to transpose, since they would end up playing different drums assigned to those other keys. To prevent this from happening, you tell the 2600 that a specific, dr specific track is a drum track so that it will not respond to transposition. You can set this parameter on the common page in the editor. So if I go to song 300, and we look inside the editor, you will see the tracks 2 and 3 are set as drum tracks. There is one last parameter you need to set to trigger songs from keys. I'll go back to my arrangement song and press Edit. Notice the parameter called Trigger Channel. I have this set to MIDI Channel 7. I've called up a lead sound on Channel 7, and when I play the notes I have assigned to trigger the steps, the song plays without playing the lead sound. But when I play any other notes, you hear that lead. <laughs>
Now we'll take a look at Kurzweil's unique RAM Tracks feature. This feature allows you to record a sample while your sequence is playing. The Kurzweil will automatically create a program to play your sample and place it in your sequence so that playback of the sample is synced correctly to your song. You will need to have the sampling option in your unit to take advantage of this feature. I'll start by calling up a song which has some basic rhythm section tracks. Now, I'm going to record a guitar part to add to the song. Go to the program mode, and then press sample to get to the sampling page. Make sure that input is set to analog, and source is set to external. Next, set the sampling time for enough seconds to record what you need. Of course, the maximum amount of time you can choose will depend on how much sample RAM you have in your instrument. I'll turn the monitor parameter to on so I can hear what I'm playing through the Kurzweil. Then I'll set the mode parameter to mono left, since I'm recording from a mono source. Next, I have to adjust the gain parameter so that I have a good signal coming into the Kurzweil. The level meters show the level of the signal. As in any recording, you want to get the signal as close to 0 dB as possible without pinning the meters. The next thing that I'll do is set the threshold so that it doesn't actually begin sampling until it reaches a level that's above the level that I set. So in this case, I can see that the level is reaching negative 4 dB, but I'll set the threshold for negative 24. That way, as soon as it goes over that, we'll begin the sampling process. In order for the RAM tracks feature to work, the song must be playing before the actual sampling begins. If you want to start sampling from the beginning of the first bar of music, then make sure that you have the click parameter set to count off so that you get a count off before the song starts playing. If you have a keyboard, you can simply press the dedicated play button. For those of you with a rack, pressing the left and right cursor buttons together will start the current song. Now I'll press record in the sample mode but it will actually wait to begin sampling until I exceed the threshold limit. Once I've done that, I can press play and begin my performance. Once you finish recording, you can press stop to stop sampling, or if you run out of sampling time, the Kurzweil will stop automatically. This also stops the song playback as well. Now the Kurzweil asks you to strike a key to set the sample root, or you can press default to set it to C4. Next, the Kurzweil will give you a display showing you the maximum level signal or number of clips. You want to see a maximum level fairly close to 0 dB to have a good quality signal, or one with relatively few clips. Press Yes, and the Kurzweil takes you to the standard saving dialog where you can name and save the sample. Although we always recommend that you name all of your objects to help make it easy to keep track of them, for now, we'll just save with the default name of New Sample. Now the Kurzweil asks you if you want to place the sample in the song. So we press yes. Next, you're allowed to pick which track you want to use for playback of this RAM track. The first time you record a RAM track, you should pick an unused track. Because the Kurzweil will be creating a program to play back the sample, and that program needs to be on its own MIDI channel.
Finally, the Kurzweil asks you to strike a key, which will be used to play back this sample. This key is different than the root key. It's the key number used to actually trigger the event in the sequence. The Kurzweil makes sure that the sample plays back at the right pitch, regardless of which trigger key you select. Now, if you go to the song and scroll to the track you chose, you will see that there is a new program assigned to that track. Since I did not choose a new name when I saved the sample, the program is called New Sample, which is the same name of the sample object. This track will have a note event in it, which triggers the sample to play back correctly so that it's in time with the song. You can continue recording more RAM tracks. Once you've recorded the first RAM track, you can choose the same song track to use for your additional RAM track. In fact, each song track can have up to 32 RAM tracks. This is because the Kurzweil will put each sample on its own separate layer in the program, and a program can have up to 32 layers. You can then go back and edit each layer to assign any vast programming and further alter your RAM track. You can also choose different song tracks for each RAM track, in which case each sample will end up on its own program. One final thing you should know about RAM tracks. Because there is no way to actually sync sample playback to MIDI, if you have a sample which plays back over a long period of time, it can drift in relation to MIDI events. You can have up to a half millisecond of drift per minute. So for this reason, you're better off recording your RAM tracks in several shorter phrases rather than a simple, long sample. There is one final step to working with a song, and that is to add effects. But before we show you how to do this, you need to learn a little bit more about how the effects work in the K2600. In the next section, we'll cover the basics of KD effects, and then come back afterwards to show you how to use effects with a song. Now let's take a close look at the KDFX Studio. Press the Effects Mode button. As we saw previously, you can call up a studio from within a program or a setup, but it's also possible to select a studio on the main effects page. Let's take a minute to define what a studio is. There's a very good reason we have called this object a studio, and that is because it really follows the concept of a recording studio environment. For those of you who have experience in working in a recording studio, you'll find the following to be familiar. Imagine that you have a mixing board with four stereo input channels, or they can be even configured as eight mono inputs, or a combination in between. For each channel input, you have two EQs. For each channel, you also have two effect sends. Now, over in a rack on the side, you have four stereo effect processors plus an additional effects processor that can be used as a global effects processor. Finally, you have an audio patch bay that lets you route a signal from anywhere in the chain to any specific output jack. As you can see from looking at this graphic, editing a studio allows you to choose how you want to route a signal, set EQ and effects, and send it to a specific output. Now, take a look at the display of the 2600. The first two parameters are effects mode and effects channel. These parameters are important to understand because they determine how the studio is controlled. Remember that even though you can have multiple effects, they are accessed from a studio, and only a single studio can be active at one time. So you use the effects mode parameter to choose what will control the studio. The default value is auto. This means that whichever mode you're currently in is controlling the effects. Each program and setup has a studio assigned to it. So if you go to program mode and call up a program, the studio assigned to the program on the KDFX page and the program editor will be called up. For example, if we go to program mode, 
call up number one, and then go back to effects mode. You'll see that the studio number is 49. If you go back to program mode, call up number 20, and then go back to the effects. You'll see number 181. The same would apply for setups. The effects mode parameter works in conjunction with the effects channel. The default value for this is current. This means that the program assigned to the MIDI channel currently in the, the display is in control of the effects. But you can also set this to a specific channel. For example, you could set it so that the program on channel 1 is in control of the studio. As we mentioned, in auto, either a program or a setup can be in control, depending on which mode you're in. You can also set this parameter to setup or program only. The final value is master. When set to master, the studio that you call up on this page will be the one that you hear, no matter what program you call up. In this situation, the effects channel parameter is meaningless. For practical purposes, you'll normally want to leave effects mode set to auto and effects channel set to current. That way, no matter where you are in the instrument, you'll hear the studio associated with what you're looking at. The only exception to this is when you're sequencing and using an external sequencer instead of the Kurzweil's own song mode. In this case, you should set effects mode to program and effects channel to a specific MIDI channel. We'll cover this example more thoroughly later in the video. Since you will most typically be controlling a studio from a program or setup, we'll explore the studio from within a program. Go to program mode and call up program 199, the default program. Now press edit to enter the program editor. Then press the write more button six times. Now press the KDFX button. Now let's add an effect to the program. The first parameter on the screen is the studio. A studio is a single object which consists of multiple effects and EQs plus signal and output routing. We'll be going into great detail in the studio, but first, I want to review an easy way to try different effects from the preset studios. Select studio number one, then take a look at the name. The 2600 has four separate effect buses, plus a global auxiliary effect. As mentioned previously, when covering setups, we have named our preset studios so that you can tell what the various effects are in the studio. In this studio, there is a room reverb on effects bus 1, a chorus on effect bus 2, and the delay on effect bus 3. Effects bus 4 has no effects assigned to it, which is indicated by the space between delay and hall. In all of our preset studios, we have left effects bus 4 set to no effect, so that you always have one dry bus to choose from if you need it. Finally, a hall reverb is assigned as the auxiliary effect. Now, Press the left more button three times, and then press the output soft button. As we did when we edited the setup, if you switch the output setting, you can choose which effect in the current studio that will be used for this layer in the program. Notice the pair parameter is set to KDFX A. One thing that you should understand is that the output pair parameter on this page does not refer to the actual output jacks on the back of the instrument. Instead, it refers to an output which sends the signal out of the synthesizer part of the 2600 and into the effects part of the 2600. All of our preset studios are designed to be as easy to use as possible, so we always have KDFX A going to FX bus 1, KDFX B going to FX bus 2, and so on. Remember that in our studio, we had a reverb, a chorus, and a delay. Since our layer is now set to KDFX A, you will hear that room reverb when you play the instrument. Now, switch it to B. When you play, you'll hear a chorus. If we switch it to C, we'll hear a delay. We have not yet heard the auxiliary hall reverb because it's not connected within the studio. But as you can see, it's very easy to try out different effects by picking a studio and then switching layers in the program to various outputs. 
Now, put the output back to KDFXA. Now press the right more button three times, and then the KDFX button. Select Studio 199, the default studio, and press Edit. You're now in the Studio Editor on the FX Bus page. We'll explore the studio in the order that the signal flows through it. So press the Input button, and we'll start at the beginning of the studio. The display shows the first part of the signal path of the studio. Notice that in the upper right-hand corner, it says Input A. And there's also an A at the beginning of the signal path. This A corresponds with the output setting of KDFX A that is chosen in the program editor. Remember previously in this video, we were editing a program and we were able to switch effects by changing the output to A, B, C, or D. What we were actually doing was changing which input we were using going into the studio. To switch inputs, you use the channel bank buttons to the, to the left of the display. Make sure that you have the input set to A and play your keyboard. Notice that the arrow leading from the A to the first EQ flickers. This gives you a visual monitor of when a signal is coming in from that input. If you switch to input B and play, you'll see that the arrow doesn't flicker showing you that this program has its layers routed to A. This can be very useful if you're playing a program or setup which is using multiple input buses for the different layers of programs, helping you to keep track of where everything is being routed. In the upper left-hand corner of the display, the currently highlighted parameter says SP. This means that this input is set for stereo with panning. You can change it to stereo with balance or to mono. For info on these settings, you should consult your manual. We'll leave it set to stereo with pan. Now, let's look at the signal path itself. The first two boxes are the two EQs that we talked about before. By highlighting a box, you can choose from several different types of EQ for each of the two EQ segments. The Kurzweil offers low and high shelving EQ, a fixed width parameter EQ, a low and high pass filtering. If you have chosen a shelf or a parametric EQ, then you'll see two parameters below it. The G is a gain parameter and the F is the frequency. For example, if I set the high shelf frequency to 880 hertz, then I can boost or cut the frequencies above 880 hertz by changing the gain. gain is left at 0 dB, then in essence, you have no EQ, since you are not boosting or cutting any frequencies. If you choose a low pass or high pass, then you will only see a frequency parameter. Any frequencies above or below that parameter, depending on whether you choose low pass or high pass, are cut off. After passing through the two EQs, you can see that the signal is split and sent to two different effects buses. Remember when I described the basic concept of a studio? I said each channel on our pretend mixing board had two effect sends, and that there were four separate effects processors in our pretend rack. These are called effects buses in the Kurzweil. By highlighting these boxes, you can choose which effect buses each input will be routed to. In this case, we see input A is routed to effects bus 1 and effects bus 2. Below each effects bus is a level parameter. This allows you to control how much signal is sent into that effect. The level under the first box is set at 0 dB, which means the signal passes into the effect without any changes. Notice that the level under the second box is set to off. So even though it's possible to send the input to both effect buses, in this case, input A is only being sent to effects bus 1. Now, Let's scroll through the inputs with the channel bank buttons and look at the bus assignments. You will see that the level of the second box is set to off, or the effects bus is set to none for all four of the inputs. 
And if you look at the first box, you'll see that input A goes to effects bus 1. Input B goes to effects bus 2. C goes to 3. And D goes to 4. To make things consistent, this is the way we have programmed all of the preset studios. Of course, you can program the routing any way that you need. But we have stuck with this simple system in the presets to make things as easy as possible for you. As you start switching through the different preset studios, you can always depend on the routing to follow this simple scheme. Now, press the Effects Bus Soft button. This is where you actually choose the effect that you want for each bus. The display tells you which bus you're looking at in the upper right-hand corner, as well as the left side of the signal flow diagram. Once again, you use the channel bank buttons to switch between the buses. Let's assign effects preset 1, nice little booth, to effects bus 1. Again, if you play the keyboard, you'll see that the arrow leading into the effects preset blinks, indicating that the signal is going into the effect. Notice that on the top line, it now says size 1 and free 3. These refer to what we call processing allocation units, or PAUs. Each effect algorithm requires a specific amount of processing power. The more complicated effects require more power and therefore take up more PAUs. There are a total of four POWs that can be split among the four effects buses, plus three POWs for the global auxiliary effect. So this means that if you pick an effect which uses more than one POW, at least one of your other effect buses won't be able to have an effect on it. The top line of the display shows you how many POWs a specific effect uses and how many are left unused after totaling the effects from all four buses. Press the channel up button to go to effect bus 2 and select effects preset 135, 8 tap delay. The display shows you this effect uses two POWs. Since we're already using one POW for effects bus 1, there's only one POW left, so free is set to 1. Now scroll to effects bus 3 and select effects preset 176. This uses our last POW, so now free is set to 0. If you change the effect preset to 177, you'll notice it's in parentheses. This is because this effect uses two POWs, but there's only one free. So this effect would not be used and no effect is called up on this bus. Now, scroll back to Effects Bus 2 and play the keyboard. Notice that you're still hearing the reverb effect, not a delay. And the arrow does not even blink. This is because input B leads into Effects Bus 2. But our program has its output assigned to input A of KDFX. This demonstrates that it's easy to be hearing one thing and looking at something else, based on how you have your signal routed. That is why the blinking arrow is very useful. Now, go back to effects bus 1, and we'll look at the rest of the signal path. After going through the effect, the signal can then be sent to an auxiliary effect, or directly to the mix, or both of them. It can also be sent directly to an output, which we will discuss in a moment. Just as we saw on the input page, there are level settings for both aux and mix allowing you to increase or decrease the signal before sending it into that area. Right now, aux level is off, so that no signal is going to the aux effect, and everything goes to the mix. It is also possible to send all of the signal to the aux and set the mix to off. Let's set the level for the aux to 0 dB. I'll press 0 and enter, and leave the mix also at 0 dB. Now, press the aux button. This is where you select the effects preset that is used as the aux effect. Let's call up effects preset 61, semi-suite hall. One thing to remember about the aux effect is that it is a single global effect. So if you have more than one effects bus set to go into the aux effect, they will all get the same effect added. But since you can set the level of the signal for each effects bus, you can choose how much signal from that bus is sent into the aux effect. Now, play your keyboard. Notice that the arrow once again blinks, 
showing you signal is coming into the aux effect. You should also notice that your signal is louder now. It is actually twice as loud. Let's look at why this happens. Notice that the signal coming out of the aux effect is going into the mix with the level set at 0 dB. Now, go back to the effects bus page and look at the signal path. You can see that the signal is split when it comes out of the effects bus and sent equally to the aux and the mix. But on the aux page, we also have the signal going back into the mix. So the mix is getting two signals coming into it, one directly from the effects bus with the booth reverb, and also from the aux effect, which includes both the booth and hall reverbs. In other words, it gets twice as much signal, so it's twice as loud. If you want to bring the signal back down, there are several approaches you could take. One way would be to set the level going from the effects bus to the mix to off. This way, the whole signal goes directly through the booth and then into the hall and then to the mix. Or, you can lower one or more of the level parameters on this page and the aux page. Obviously, depending on where you choose to lower the level, that will determine on how much reverb you hear in the relation to the overall signal. The final way you can lower the level is to bring down the mix level on the output page, which we'll look at next. As you can see, you have a great deal of control over your signal as it passes through various stages in the studio. As you become more familiar with KDFX, we encourage you to experiment with various approaches to signal routing and see what types of end results that you can get. Now, press the output button. This is the final stage of the studio. This is where you determine what you hear coming out of the specific physical outjacks on the 2600. This page also allows you to control the level of the mix. In our current example, we doubled the signal level by having the signal going both to the mix and aux and feeding the aux back into the mix with everything set at 0 dB. To bring the signal back to its original level, we can set the mix level to negative 3 dB. Now let's look at the output parameters. These outputs correspond to actual pairs of jacks on the 2600. We see that output A is set to mix, and all other outputs are set to off. So all the signals are going to be coming out of the A separate outs or out of the mix outs, and nothing will come out of the other separate outs. We have programmed all of the preset studios in this manner. So if you have the ability to run multiple outputs into your system, you will need to edit the studios for this. Let's look at the various possible values for the outputs. The first possible value is off, which is obviously no output. Next, we see pre-effect 1. This will give you all signals sent to effects bus 1 previous to its running through the effect, but after the EQs and any pan or balance adjustments. Remember that it is possible to assign more than one input to an effects bus, so you could have several signals mixed together. But as we mentioned before, all of our preset studios have each input sent to a different effects bus. So in the case of our preset studios, this will always be the signals coming from input A. Next, we see effects bus 1. As you would expect, this is the signal after it has run through the effect on that bus. Again, it could have signals coming from multiple inputs, but in our preset studios, this will be the signal sent to input A. Next, we have pre-effects and effects bus settings for the other three buses. After that, we have aux effect. This will give you the output of the aux effects bus. Remember that in order to hear a signal with this setting, you would need to send the signal from an effects bus into the aux effects by setting the level to something other than off. Finally, we have mix. Let's talk for a moment about the mix output jacks versus the mix setting on the output page. These are two separate things, but since they're named the same, this can be confusing. Remember that I mentioned at the beginning of the video that all signals will come out of the mix output jacks. This is hardwired into the instrument and requires no programming. In general, you'll probably find it easiest to plug cables into the separate outs using just the A outs if you have only room for two inputs in your mixing board. So, when would you want to use the mix outs? Let's say that you use your 2600 in both a studio and live setting. In this studio, you want to use multiple outputs, and so you edit your studios to route the signals to the different outs. 
but when you perform live, you might want to keep things as simple as possible and use only two outputs. Instead of having to go back and reprogram all of your studios, you can simply plug into the mix outs and everything will come out of those two outputs. Go back to the mix value on the output page. This mix has to do with the mixing of the signals from the various effect buses in the studio. Typically, this might be a mix of all four effects buses, but it doesn't have to be. Remember that on the effects bus and the aux effects page, you can determine whether or not the signal is sent into the mix. So you might choose to mix two different effects buses together and send that to one output pair while sending the other effects buses directly to other outputs. As you can see, there are many possibilities for how you might choose to route signals to your output jacks. One way might be to set output A to effects bus 1, output B to effects bus 2, and so forth. But if no output is set to the aux effects or mix, you could never hear the aux effect. Or you could set one of your outputs to aux or mix and set the others to separate effects buses, and then send only certain buses into the, into the aux effect. The best thing is that since this is all programmable for a studio, you can make different studios for different needs and quickly switch between them. Once you have your studio configured the way you want it, you can name and save the studio. When you exit out of the studio editor, you'll be back in the program editor with your new studio assigned to the program. Now we'll explore how you can control and change your effect settings when playing a program or setup or when sequencing. First we'll take a quick look at the effects themselves. Let's start again in program mode on program 199. Then go into the program editor and go to the KD effects page. Call up Studio One and press Edit. Once again you're in the Studio Editor and you can see that the bassy room effect is called up on effects bus one. Now, press edit again. We call an individual effect an effect preset, and you can see the display shows you are in the effect preset editor. An effect preset consists of a basic effect algorithm plus editable parameters. Different algorithms will have different types of parameters, so the display will change depending what algorithm is chosen. Here we can see this effect uses the mini verb reverb algorithm, and so we can set such parameters here as the reverb time, pre-delay time, etc. If you press the parameter to soft button, you'll see that you can select the room type and other settings. Now, press exit, and then use the channel bank buttons to scroll to effect bus 3. This has the fluid chorus delay reverb. Press edit again. This time the algorithm shows chorus and delay and reverb. Notice. There are now four param soft buttons. Depending on complexity of the effect, you will have different numbers of editable parameters for the effect. If you want to customize the effects, you can edit the parameter here and save new effect presets. But Kurzweil also makes it very easy to change these parameters from outside of the effect preset. And this is what we're going to look at next. Press exit so that you're back in the studio editor. The first type of effects editing you can do outside of the effect preset is called a bus override, or bus mod, and you have two of them available for each effect bus, plus two for the aux effect. If you look at parameters under effects three, you will see two marked wet, dry, and out gain. If you scroll down, you will see that you can easily change the wet, dry amount, which will override the setting found within the preset. Wet, dry, and out gain are the typical default parameters displayed, but in fact, you can almost override 
any parameter in the effect preset. If you scroll one parameter to the left, you will see that you can change wet-dry to other editable parameters in the effect preset. Notice that as you change the parameter, the value also changes, showing you the current value for that parameter within the preset. You can then scroll back to the value and change it to a new value. As you can see, this gives you the ability to customize the studio without having to edit the individual presets and save them. Now, we will look at the second way of modifying the parameters, which is even more powerful. Press exit and then no to the save changes screen. Now you're back on the KDFX page in the program editor. Notice the parameters below the studio. These are called effects mods. Press the down arrow key and you should be on the first bus parameter. Virtually every parameter from the studio can be, be controlled from the program, including input EQ sections, all the effects buses, the aux effect, and the mix levels. Change the bus parameter to the next value. It now says in A. If you scroll one parameter to the right, you can now select the various EQ and send parameters found on the input A page within the studio. Let's set it to EQ2, treble gain. Now let's look at the next three columns. The adjust amount will change the fixed amount that was set within the studio. This works in the same way the bus override parameters did in the studio editor. So, I could increase the amount of treble EQ by boosting the gain here without having to edit and save the studio. But what is even better is that I can assign real-time control to these EQ settings. Scroll over to the source and set it to controller number six. This is data. Remember that in the default control setup, slider A is assigned to data. Now scroll over to the depth parameter and set it to 6 dB. Now as I move the slider up, I boost the amount of treble. Now scroll down to the next bus parameter and let's look at the possible bus values. In addition to inputs A through D, you'll also see effects 1 through effects 4, plus aux and mix. As you change the selection, the available editable parameters will change. Set the bus to effect 1. Now, when you scroll through the values in the parameter column, you see all of the editable parameters from the Basie Room effects preset, since that is what's on effect bus 1. Set it to wet dry. Then, scroll to the Adjust and set it to zero. And now you'll hear no reverb. Now, scroll to Source. And one nice thing is that you can set several effects mods to the same control source. So you can assign this also to data. Set the depth to 75%. Now, as I move the slider up, it boosts the treble, and at the same time, it increases the amount of reverb. Of course, I could set the wet-dry mix to a different slider. If I change it to controller 22, it will be controlled by slider B. Press Edit. This jumps you back into the Studio Editor. Notice that the wet-dry parameter now says Effects Mod. This indicates that the wet-dry mix is being controlled by an Effects Mod from the program. Now press Exit. The KD Effects page gives you three Effects Mods, but if you look at the Effects Mod 2, 3, and 4 pages, you'll see that each of them has five Effects Mods on the page 
giving you a total of 18 different parameters in the studio that you can control. As you can see, this gives you a tremendous amount of power to control and change your effects. Let's take a look at one more program to see effects mods in action. Let's look again at program 80, Poly Real Mini. Go into the program edit and scroll to the KDFX page. You can see that the mix level and the treble EQ frequency for input A have been adjusted to set levels, and the EQ treble gain is controlled by controller 24, which is slider D. If you look at the other effect mod pages, you will see that controllers 23 through 29 have been used to control many different aspects of the studio. Controller 23 through 28 correspond with sliders C through H, and controller 29 is switch number 2. Also, on the Effect Mod 4 page, you will see that the delay tempo for the effect on Effect Bus 1 is controlled by system. This means that it will follow a MIDI clock. You can use the Kurzweil's internal clock or sync to an external clock, depending on the setting of the clock parameter in song mode. You'll find the same set of effects mod pages in the setup editor. If you want to use the effect mods when in setup mode, remember that for any real-time control, you will need to assign the controllers to send the specific MIDI controller numbers you assign on the effects mod pages. These controllers must be assigned in zone one of the setup. One very useful feature is the ability to import a studio from another program or setup. For example, here's a program that I created which does not yet have effects on it. I have another program I created which has an effect that I want to use on this program. So I go into the program editor and scroll to the import effects page. And then I press it. Now I'll call up the program which has the effect I want to import. I can play the keyboard while I'm on this page and hear the studio associated with any program or setup. Once I have the effect I want, I just press import. One of the best things about using import is that the Kurzweil not only imports the studio, but it also imports all of the effects mods from the other program or setup so I don't have to go back and assign all of the controllers in my new program. They're now set the same way that, as they were in the other program. As you can see, this is a real time saver, and it also allows you to easily grab studios and all their effects mods from our preset programs and setups. Now, let's talk about using the effects in a sequence. So far, we've seen that each program and setup has its own studio assigned to it, but you can only have one studio active at a time. So once you're sequencing, using multiple programs on different channels, you need to be able to choose which studio will be used. In addition, if you're going to change effect settings in real time with sliders or other controllers, then you need to be able to record those controller movements onto a track. For this reason, the best way to work when creating a sequence is to create, create a special program for controlling the studio. Then use one of your sequence tracks to be used just for effects control. The first thing you do is choose the channel you will use for this track. Go to song mode and call up the song you created earlier. I'm going to use an example that I created. Press edit. On the common page, you'll see the effect channel parameter. You want to choose a channel that you aren't already using for a track. I often use channel 15 because channel 16 is being used for the click. Now exit the editor and save the song. Set your record track to the track that is assigned to the channel. In this case, track 15. Now highlight the program parameter. You can start with any program assigned to this track. It doesn't matter what sounds are in the program, since you won't be using the program to play any notes. Now press edit. The Kurzweil takes you into the program editor, exactly the same as if you pressed edit when in program mode. At this point, you can go to the KDFX page and call up the studio you want. Then you can assign any effects mods you want to use. In my case, 
I already have a program which has the studio and effects mods that I want. So I'll go to import effects and import them from my program. Once you have everything set, save and name the program and exit out of the editor. I'll just keep it set to default program. Now you return to the song mode. We need to do one more thing in order to hear the proper effects for each channel. And that is to set the outputs for the programs. Remember that the output settings in the programs are what you use to route the programs into various inputs in the studio. You can edit each program individually to set the output the way you want. But there's also another way to do this, which is often easier. Press the MIDI button, then the Channel Soft button. On this page, you'll see a parameter called Out Pair. Typically, this parameter will be set to Prog, which means that the output settings within the program will be used. But if you set this parameter to KDFX A, B, C, or D, then you override those settings and you force whichever program is on this MIDI channel to use that output. So you can scroll through each channel with the channel bank buttons and set each channel to the output that you want. I'm going to set channels 1 and 3 to KDFX B and channel 4 to KDFX C. I'm leaving channel 2 set to, to Prog because my drum program has different layers set to different outputs so that the various drums have different effects. The advantage of using this method is that you don't have to edit and save each program you're using in the song. But these settings are global, so if you have another song and it has different routing, you'll need to change these settings each time you change songs. Once you have set the outputs the way you need, go back to song mode. To make sure the correct studio is always called up when you play the song, record a couple of bars for this track. That will cause the Kurzweil to put the program and bank changes into the track to call up your program. Now, if you want to change effect settings throughout the song, you can use this track to record controller movements that you program as effects mods. OK, now we'll have some fun and go to our effects track. And I'm prepared now to use the sliders to do some real-time control of our effects. So if I hit record and play, we'll record my actions. Save this because I liked it, replace, and there you have it. So far, I've shown how to assign and control the effects after having recorded my tracks, and I've chosen a studio in which I already knew exactly how everything would sound. But what if you need to be able to audition effects for a track while you're working on the song? I'm going to show you a trick which will make this easy to do. Remember that we have track 15 set to control the effects. So in order to change the effects I have in the studio, I will set the record track to 15, then highlight the program parameter, and press Edit. This jumps me into the program editor, and I can scroll to the KDFX page and press Edit again to go into the studio editor. So now I can change the effect assigned to each bus. But when I play the keyboard, I hear the program assigned to track 15. But what I need to hear are the programs that are being used in my song. So now, what I can do is press the Mix Down button. If you have a rack, you can still get to this page by pressing the Clear button. Now, as I highlight a track on this page, the keyboard changes the MIDI channel that it's transmitting on, so I can hear each program. I want to change the effect I have for the lead sound of my song. 
So I'll scroll to that track, as I've done. Now I press Exit. The screen returns me back to the studio editor, but I'm still transmitting on channel 4 instead of channel 15. So when I play, I can hear my lead sound instead of the program on channel 15. I know track 4 is set to KDFX-C, so I'll scroll to Effects Bus C. Now I can change the effect and hear what it sounds like with my lead sound. <laughs> Once I've found the effect I want, I can press exit and save my studio. Then I press exit again to jump out of the program editor and I'm back in the song mode. Notice that when I play the keyboard, I'm back to hearing the program on channel 15 instead of my lead sound on channel 4. For those of you who use an external sequencer, you can still use the same concept of creating a special program to call up your studio and record a track of controller information for your effects mods. There's only one thing you need to set differently. When using the Kurzweil song mode, you choose the channel you will use for effect control within the song editor. But if you're using a, an external sequencer, that parameter does not apply. In this case, the solution is to go to the main effects page. Set effects mode to program. Then set effects channel to the specific channel you want to use for effects control. Now you can go ahead and create a program for effects control in the exact same way and call it up on your chosen channel. Once you start creating your own programs and samples, you're going to want to start saving them to disk. Let's take a moment and talk about memory. There are two kinds of RAM memory in the 2600, sample RAM and PRAM. Sample RAM is used only for actual sample data, whether it's samples you make yourself or that you load from disk. If you have the sampling version of the 2600, your unit comes with 4 meg of sample RAM. If you have the basic unit, you have no sample RAM. Either way, you can expand your unit up to 128 meg using SIMS. This type of memory is volatile. That is, when you turn the unit off, the samples will be lost, making it necessary to save them to disk before turning the unit off. The other type of RAM, PRAM, is used to hold all objects except for the actual samples. This type of RAM is battery backed. However, it is always a good idea to back up your data by saving it to disk anyway. Press the disk mode button. The current disk parameter is highlighted. If you have not changed this from the factory default, it will be set at floppy. You can use this parameter to select either the floppy drive or a SCSI drive. Each device in a SCSI chain needs to have its own separate ID. There are eight possible IDs numbered between 0 and 7. The default number for the 2600 is 6. If you're planning on hooking your 2600 up to a SCSI drive, we recommend that you read the SCSI information in the manual. SCSI has several rules that need to be followed, or you can end up with corrupt data. For now, we'll be working with the floppy drive, so set the current drive to floppy. Take a double density or high density disk and put it in the drive. Make sure the write protect tab is in the down position. The K2600 uses a DOS format for its floppy disks. If you have a disk pre-formatted for DOS, you can save to it without formatting. Otherwise, you must format the disk. Press one of the More buttons till you see Format and press it. Answer Yes, and you will be asked whether to format it to a 720K or 1.4 meg. Double density disks are 720K and high density disks are 1.4 meg. You should always format the disk for the appropriate size. If you try and format a double density disk for 1.4, it 
it will fail the formatting process. Press yes in the next couple of screens and the formatting process starts. For those of you working with a SCSI drive, the process is basically the same. However, you will not be given the choice of size to format the drive. The 2600 will format it for the appropriate size. There are a couple of things to know about formatting SCSI. If you are using an optical drive, make sure to use a cartridge that is formatted for 512 bytes per sector instead of 1024 bytes per sector. The second thing is that the 2600 does not format SCSI devices in fully implemented DOS as it does with floppy disks. However, the 2600 can read and write to DOS formatted SCSI drives. So those of you with a computer may want to format the drive for the computer. Then you can hook up the drive to either the PC or the 2600. The 2600 has a limit of 2 gigs for the drive size. If you have a larger drive and format it from the 2600, it will be formatted for 2 gig. If you format your drive from the PC, Make sure to make the first partition 2 gig or less, since the K2600 only sees the first partition. The other partitions can still be used by the PC. Next, we'll talk about directories. You can group files on disk together within a directory, also known as a folder to Macintosh users. Grouping files by directory is extremely useful for organizing your sounds and songs, especially if you have a large hard drive. You can even put directories within other directories, just like on a computer. This is known as hierarchical file system. Press the Write More button and select New Directory. You are then asked to name the directory. The name can be up to eight characters and follows DOS naming standards. This screen looks similar to the naming screen for objects, but two of the soft buttons are different. The two arrow buttons are replaced. You can still move the cursor by using the left and right arrow buttons to the right of the display. The End soft button moves the cursor to the last character. The Choose button will display a list of names of files already on the disk. This can be useful if you're naming a series of directories with similar names. You can pull the name off the disk without having to retype it, and then modify it. We'll name our directory Video. Next, the 2600 will ask you if you want to use the current directory for the file. Since this is our first directory, just press OK. The 2600 creates a directory and returns you to disk mode. Now we're ready to save a file. For all disk operations, there are two methods you can use. One is the bank method and the other is the object method. The object method will allow you to save and load individual objects. We'll start with the bank method, since it's simpler. Press the Write More button and select Save. Notice, there are different banks of 100. If you scroll down, you will also see Everything, which saves everything in RAM, and Master, which saves all the global and MIDI parameters. When you choose a bank to save, it will save all types of objects in that bank. An asterisk after the bank indicates that there are objects in that bank. Let's look at the soft buttons on this page. Pressing Export gives you the opportunity to save a file in other formats besides the Kurzweil format. AIFF and WAV are two different sample formats. MIDI stands for a standard MIDI file, which is a standard format for sequences. Once you have selected your format, the K2600 will display any objects that would apply to that format. Since we have neither samples or songs in memory at this point, the display shows nothing. Press Cancel, then Save again. The Object Soft button allows you to use the object method of saving. We'll be showing this method later. The New Directory Soft button performs the same feature found on the Disk Mode page. It is also placed here, so you can create a new directory to save a file without having to exit the save page. We'll save the 200s bank, since that is where we saved the program we created. Once 200 through 299 is highlighted, press OK. Once again, we see the naming page. We'll name our file Dream, and press OK to save it.
Next, the 2600 asks which directory we wish to save in and shows the current directory. In this case, it's the root directory, which is the top level of the disk hierarchy. This is indicated by the backslash with no other directory names. We want to save the file in our video directory, so press change. The top line of the display shows that we are in the root directory. The display shows all directories and files found within the current level. In this case, there's only one directory. The three soft buttons on the left side will help you navigate through the directories. Since you can have directories placed within other directories, these buttons allow you to move up and down through the hierarchy. The root button takes you immediately to the top level. The parent button moves you back up one level, and the open button shows you the directories within the current directory. Pressing current will save the file to the current root level directory. If you want to save the file within the video directory, press set directory button. The file is then saved. Now, let's load a file into the 2600. For this example, we'll load a file from one of the disks that came with your 2600. This disk is marked Demos. Put the disk in the drive and press load. The 2600 looks at the disk and will display all the files and directories in the root level directory. You want to take some time exploring the files on this disk. There's a directory full of demo sequence files. Scroll down until you see the file marked Video. This time we'll use the object method to load individual objects. Press Open. The 2600 reads the file and will display all the objects in the file. You can select individual objects to load. Simply scroll till that object is highlighted and press Select. An asterisk will appear next to the name indicating it's been selected. You can scroll through all the objects and select as many as you want this way. Once you've selected objects, you may want to double check the items you have selected. Pressing the Next Soft button will jump you to the next selected item in the list. If you have different types of objects in the file, pressing the Type Soft button will jump you to the first object for each type in the list. Another way to select objects is by using the Multi Soft button. Pressing this button gives you a new screen, which will allow you to select objects by various criteria. If the Select parameter is set to Type Range, you can select various types of objects within a selected range of IDs. For example, you could choose to load only programs with IDs between 200 and 250. The All, Type, and Toggle and Clear Soft buttons will help you in quickly selecting or deselecting groups of objects. There are also other settings for the Select parameter. Check your manual for a detailed description of these features. Once you have chosen the objects you wish to be selected, press the Set Soft button. You will be returned to the Object Load page, and you'll see that the objects you choose now have an asterisk indicating that they have been selected. Now, press OK. You'll then be asked which bank you want to load the objects into. Let's pick the 200 bank. Next, a group of soft buttons appear, which allow you to pick the method the 2600 will use to load the objects. If you started with an empty bank, you'll see only append and fill. Since we started with a bank that already contained objects, we also see overfill, overwrite, and merge. Each of these methods will load in the objects to different locations, depending on what is in the file and what is already in that bank. For a complete description of the differences between the various choices, consult your manual. For now, we'll choose append. The 2600 loads the objects and returns to disk mode. If you go to program mode and scroll through the bank, 
you'll see the objects you chose. Disk mode also gives you other tools for manipulating files and directories. You can delete or rename them. You can move them from within one directory to another. You can also copy individual files or backup directories from one disk to another. These features work in much the same manner as loading and saving. So you can consult the manual if you have any further questions on that. You will also find a soft button marked Utilities. In this window, you can check the amount of free space on your current disk, list the files in various directories, or find a file or directory by using a search string. Another feature of disk mode is the ability to create macros. Macros allow you to automate loading multiple files. Once you create the macro, you simply load the macro, and it will go and load the various files that you have specified. You can even create a boot macro, which will load automatically each time you turn the instrument on. For details on these features, you should check out your manual. Kurzweil is well known for supporting and updating our instruments for years after they're released. One of the great things about the 2600 is that the operating system is on flash ROM. This means that as we release updates to the operating system, you can easily download them from our website and install them in your instrument. So be sure to check out our website on a regular basis for new versions of the operating system. You can check the version of the OS in your unit simply by turning it on and watching the display. The version number is displayed during the power-up process. There are several options which you can add to your 2600. Some of these options are user-installable. If you look on the bottom of your instrument, you'll see eight screws attaching a removable panel to the instrument. When you remove those screws and take off the panel, you'll see a circuit board with various slots on it. One of these slots holds the PRAM option, which will increase the amount of battery-backed RAM. This RAM is used for holding everything that you can name and save into memory, except for samples. Next to the PRAM slot are two slots for holding sample RAM. The K2600 uses standard 72-pin SIMs for holding samples. SIMs are not battery-backed, so you must save your samples to disk before you turn off your unit, or the samples will be erased. The K2600 can hold up to 128 meg of sample RAM. Also, on this board, are four slots for holding ROM expansion options. These ROM options add additional samples, programs, and setups. Currently, there are two ROM blocks, contemporary and orchestral, each of which adds eight meg of ROM samples with 100 programs and 50 setups. Two additional ROM blocks will be released in the future. Also, on this board is a lithium disk battery for the battery back RAM, which can be replaced when the battery runs low. There are several other options for the K2600, which must be installed by an authorized service center. You can add an internal SCSI hard drive. If you purchased a 2600 without sampling, you can add it with a sampling option. Finally, the KDS option adds the ability to output or input eight channels of digital audio to Kurzweil's digital multitrack interface, or even to another K2600. I hope you've enjoyed this video and found it to be both helpful and informative. So now, Sit down in front of your instrument, start playing, and have some fun.